I'm Amy Ziegert. I'm a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute and the Hoover Institution. And I have the great pleasure of being one of the instructors of this honors seminar. Along with uh, Professor Rod Ewing and Dr. Isfandiar Mir, I wanna welcome everybody, family, friends, faculty, colleagues, uh, to the fourth and final presentation of our undergraduate honors theses. And a special thanks to our faculty advisors who have been working with uh, these two students all year long on uh, their honors theses. Uh, for those of you who haven't attended our honors presentations before, uh, each student is going to speak for about 20 minutes. Dr. Mir will give them the warning sign if they're going close to their time. There we go. <laughs> little, little demonstration, stop sign. They know to look for the stop sign. Uh, after the presentation, we'll have 10 minutes of Q&A uh, kicked off by their faculty advisors. Then we'll open it up to the class, which you see on the screen. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll open it up to questions from everyone watching the webinar. So if you are not inside the classroom, but want to ask a question, uh, just type it into the uh, Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. We'll have a five minute break between presentations. So know that that's coming. Uh, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, so our first presenter today is Kyle Duchinsky. Kyle is a senior, they're all seniors. Kyle is a senior studying economics from Santa Rosa, California. He is inspired by his experiences leading Stanford's US Russia Forum. And so his thesis examines appropriately Russia, specifically Russia's so-called pivot to Asia. Next year, Kyle is going to be returning to Stanford uh, to complete a master's degree in management science and engineering. His thesis title is called Looking East, Evaluating Russia's Pivot to Asia. And his uh, faculty advisors are Professor Norman Neymark and Professor Michael McFall. Kyle, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Zeger. Can everyone see my slides? Wonderful, so good afternoon and thank you everyone for coming. Today I will be presenting my thesis, Looking East, Evaluating Russia's Pivot to Asia. So at the September 2012 Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit held in Vladivostok along Russia's eastern seaboard, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced Russia's so-called pivot to Asia, remarking that, quote, the global economic landscape is changing literally as we speak. Amidst this shift in the global balance of power, according to Putin, pivoting would give Russia the opportunity to be an economic conduit between Europe and Asia. Seven years later, in September 2019, I was fortunate to attend the Eastern Economic Forum, also held in Vladivostok, an annual forum where Putin touts Russia's role in Asia amidst invited heads of states from many different Asian countries. And through this experience, I was inspired to further research this pivot, if it had actually happened and why. So to provide a brief summary of my thesis, my research question was two parts. First, has Russia pivoted to Asia? And if so, then why? Using a variety of economic and, and security ties data, as well as data on Russia's international standing, I conducted a medium end analysis on Russia's bilateral ties in Asia, and then did two case studies. My research led me to two primary conclusions. First, Russia's pivot to Asia is real and part of a cycle dating back long before Putin's 2012 announcement. And second, this pivot was driven by a combination of factors, including the desire for greater economic diversification and development, the search for global relevance and greater national security, and Putin himself and his relationships with other heads of state. So to give a brief overview of my presentation today, first, I'll define exactly what a pivot is according to existing literature. Then I will review each of my four hypotheses as to why Russia has pivoted. Next, I'll go over my research methodology before examining my medium and analysis, and finally, I'll review a case study on the Russia-China relationship before finally presenting conclusions and policy implications. So as it turns out, there is not an agreed upon framework for defining a pivot. Rather, my pivot framework draws upon scholarship on President Obama's pivot to Asia, namely Dr. Nina Silov's work. At a high level, a pivot is about reorienting major elements of national power towards a new region. And underneath this, there are four major elements. First, internal balancing, second, external balancing, third, expanded economic engagement, and finally, expanded diplomatic engagement. So whereas internal balancing really has to do with reallocating military resources to the new region of focus, external balancing is about increasing the military capabilities of aligned states, enhancing, enhancing multilateral interoperability, and forging new partnerships with regional powers. 
As we will see later, this external balancing piece especially is traditionally defined in a very American-centric way. And then outside of the security dimension, the third and fourth elements of pivoting have to do with increasing diplomatic and economic ties with aligned states through regional dialogues and expanded trade agreements. So now onto my fourth, four hypotheses to answer the why question. The first is the economic reasoning, that Russia's pivot helps it take advantage of the changing economic landscape Putin referred to and develop the chronically underdeveloped Russian Far East. The second is that closer ties to Asia and an increased focus on Asia helps to increase Russia's national security. Third, the international standing hypothesis, or that Russia seeks foreign policy diversification away from its traditional spheres of influence in Europe and the post-Soviet space and towards the Asia Pacific. And finally, there's the question of Putin himself, his desires and the personal relationships he has with other key heads of state. So now delving into the methodology, I'll first give a brief overview of my data. So across the three buckets you see here, I used FDI data from various government sources and AEI, trade data from the World Bank, arms transfer data from CIPRI, a joint military exercises database, military deployment data from IISS, Russian strategy documents, as well as UN voting data. So concerning the research design itself, the first question to answer was, has Russia pivoted to Asia, focusing on the time period from post-1992 to the present? To answer this question, I conducted a medium end analysis of Russia's ties with major countries across East, South, and Southeast Asia. Finding the answer to be yes, the next step was to determine why Russia pivoted. And for this, I used the medium end analysis to select two case studies to try to further delve into the exact reasoning. And these case studies were then used to prove or disprove each of the four hypotheses. So now onto the question of has Russia pivoted? My research demonstrated that the answer is yes. Russia's pivot to Asia is real and began long before 2012. So interestingly, looking to the historical record in Russian strategic documents, it's clear that the idea of Russia pivoting east is not new and has either failed or made only incremental progress over the centuries. Indeed, a pivot is a natural extension of the idea that Russia sees itself as a country with look, which looks both east and west, best symbolized by the double-headed eagle in Russia's coat of arms that was first used by Ivan III in 1497. So looking at the history again, there are numerous examples of attempted pivots east by Moscow. In the 19th century, the Russian Empire had fur trading colonies in Alaska, Hawaii, and California. Moscow also took present-day Vladivostok from China with the 1860 Convention of Peking. Then in the 20th century, Russia's defeat in the 1905 Russo-Japanese War led to a decreased attention on Asia. By 1969, Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev was trying to launch a, quote, system of collective security in Asia, end quote, not coincidentally in the same year as the Sino-Soviet border conflict. Then in 1986, Mikhail Gorbachev gave a speech in Vladivostok arguing that Asia, quote, will play an integral role in restructuring and revitalizing the Soviet economy. Step into the 21st century, every Russian foreign policy concept, which is similar to the American national security strategy since 2000, has had remarkable similarly language about the importance of Asia and the need for Russia to focus there. This again predates Putin's official 2012 announcement of a pivot. So while Russia has repeatedly attempted to pivot, as the subsequent evidence will show, Putin's intent this time is matched with evidence. In other words, even if the pivot did not start in 2012, the pivot is real, driven not only by Moscow's own deliberate actions, but also the growing economic power of Asia and sanctions from the West after the Ukrainian invasion in 2014. So now delving into the data, broadly trade data suggests a strong shift towards Asia. Here you see a major shift in Russian exports over the last 20, or Russian imports over the last 20 to 25 years, with imports from Asia accounting for around 10% of total Russian imports in 1996, compared to nearly 40% now, while European imports have fallen from a high of around 60% to around 40% today. Switching over to exports, a similar trend is also evident as the gap between Europe and Asia exports has been decreasing. Exports to Asia in particular have risen by around 10% since 2011, while exports to Europe have fallen from a peak of over 60% in the mid 2000s to 50% today. Taken together, economic data shows that the increase in trade with Asia is at the expense of that with Europe. So moving over to the security side, we'll start by looking at the Russian arms exports by region. Asia has long been a top purchaser of Russian arms driven primarily by China and India. However, since 2012, there has been a decrease in the overall value of arms shipments to Asia due to a large drop off in sales to China. 
But digging a layer deeper, external balancing is evident as because between 2014 and 2018, Russia accounted for 60% of all arms sales across Asia and Oceania. And then from 2010 to 2017, Moscow sold $6.6 billion worth of weapons to Southeast Asia, as much as the US and China combined, engaging with new partners like Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. Moreover, the number of countries Russia has sold weapons to in a given year within Asia has doubled from being only four in 1992 to eight different countries in 2019. We also see evidence of internal balancing as Russia has sought to reorient its naval posture towards the, specific, towards the Pacific, starting with the 2015 Russian Maritime Doctrine's emphasis on building up the Pacific fleet. Since the 2015 doctrine, numerous new Russian submarines, as well as the first new Russian surface ship built since the Cold War, have been assigned to the Pacific fleet, whose emphasis remains largely on strategic nuclear deterrence and littoral combat. And then back to external balancing, Russia is generally not doing the things the US would be when externally balancing, like building alliances and increasing interoperability, but it has been very invested in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, among other regional security groups, and forming looser strategic alignments. In fact, many of the peace mission joint ex military exercises arranged by Russia and China under the auspices of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization were far more of a, a political statement as opposed to genuinely improving military interoperability. Yet the American focus on interoperability need not necessarily apply when talking about near peers such as Russia and China. Moreover, Russia generally eschews traditional military alliances, instead preferring vague defense consultation agreements. In fact, Russia's only legally binding alliances, which offer mutual aid in the event of an attack, are with Osbakia and South Ossetia, two autonomous republics within Georgia. What's more important here is that Russia has been making inroads when it comes to defense cooperation with countries in Asia, notably China, and even exercises as a political statement are a huge deal considering the open conflict between China and the USSR in the not so distant past. So then I selected my case studies based on the results of this medium and analysis. And here you see Russia's bilateral relationships in Asia ranked across six key metrics outlined earlier in the presentation. So ultimately, I decided to go with India and China as they appear to be the most consequential bilateral relationships across these metrics. Moreover, there is great contrast between these two countries, India having historically good relations with the USSR and being a democracy, whereas China has a history of tenuous to bad relations with Russia and is an authoritarian state. So now I'll do a brief overview of the results of my first case study. So before analyzing specific hypotheses, it's important to understand the context of the Sino-Russian relationship. Indeed, it, it's a long, complex history with many ups and downs illustrated by this graph. So note that this graph is by no means a perfect representation, nor is it to scale, but it's more designed to show the narrative arc. So the Russia-China relationship dates back to the 13th century with the Mongol invasion, and has long been characterized by an asymmetry of power either in favor of Russia or China. During the mid 1800s, Russia forced China to cede nearly 1.5 million square kilometers of territory to Russia through a series of unequal treaties as they were called. And the relationship has really been on and off adversarial and cooperative since then with the high point arguably being the Sino-Soviet alliance and massive tech transfer and support during the 1950s. The most recent period of greater alignment arguably began in June 1989 with Gorbachev's visit to Beijing and has been characterized by a willingness to cooperate on issues, but also being quick to shift away if better foreign policy options become available elsewhere. And then today, the seesaw of the relationship historically has led to a good deal of mistrust between Russia and China. So now we'll specifically evaluate the economic hypothesis. So there's strong evidence that economic incentives have driven Russia closer to China. For Russia, China has represented a great economic opportunity, both in terms of push and pull, as China's economy has grown and Western sanctions encouraged Russia to seek economic diversification away from Europe. Starting with the balance of trade you see here, both imports and exports have on average been increasing since around 2000. And this was a gradual increase from 2000 until the financial crisis in 2008, and then a very large uptick since the Ukrainian invasion since 20, in 2014. Additionally, from 1996 to 2006, Russia exported more to China than it imported. And since then, it's been the exact opposite. And today, Russia imports about 50% more from China than it exports. And below these aggregate trading numbers, the trading relationship has changed over time. Russian manufactured goods were the number one Russia export to China until 2005. And since then, it's been far and away fuel. Now, in part, this is due to China's expanding economy, and part of it's also from the Ukrainian crisis. And interestingly, when you look, 
1996, the percent of total Russian fuel exports that went to China was around 0%. That increased to 7% in 2014. And since the Ukrainian invasion in 2014, that's ballooned all the way up to 17%. And in return for the oil, Russia imports manufactured goods, machinery, and other equipment from China, increasingly turning to China for these goods after the 2014 invasion of Ukraine. Now, some have taken this to point to the economic asymmetry in the relationship, but importantly, there is a degree of mutual dependence here, especially when it comes to oil. So here you see a breakdown of the recipients of Russian oil with it jumping out that after the Ukrainian invasion, Russia turned to the Chinese energy markets for greater economic diversification, and China has now supplied to the Netherlands as the number one importer of Russian oil. Yet at the same time, Russia has quietly become China's number one supplier of oil. More so than this, Russian oil can be supplied overland to China through a number of different pipelines, making it far less vulnerable to interdiction in the event of a regional conflict than say, oil from Saudi Arabia that would generally transit across the Indian Ocean. So now onto the security argument. So the evidence here largely supports the hypothesis, but it's not as strong of an incentive as the economic reasoning as a number of these security related ties are actually more driven by other incentives. So starting with arms sales, which are the high level or somewhat of a cross between the economic and security hypotheses. At first in the 1990s, Russian arms sales to China were a key part of saving the Russian military industrial complex from collapse as domestic demand had fallen away, which again points to the economic incentives of shifting to China. However, arms deals peaked in 2005 and have declined around 80% since then. This has been driven by a number of reasons, including Russian military staff concerns about the potential threat from China, increased domestic demand from 2008 onward with Russia's military modernization, as well as concerns about IP theft and Chinese reverse engineering of Russian systems. At the same time, this is not to say the relationship in arms sales is insignificant, even at a lower volume of deals because in fact, the quality of weapons purchased by China has increased in certain years. As in 2014, for example, China purchased the Sukhoi S-35S, Russia's most advanced combat aircraft, and the S-400, Russia's most advanced air defense system. So then on to other aspects of these security incentives, starting with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It was formed in 2001 with Russia, China, and Central Asian states, and had the goal to strengthen regional cooperation on security issues like counter-narcotics and counterterrorism. Since then, it's been less of a formal military alliance and more so just a way to engage on, on mutual interests. Still, it's held six peace mission military exercises since 2005, varying in size from 3,000 to 10,000 participants from across Russia, China, and other Central Asian states. So while some of the impetus is direct security in terms of reducing threats, the larger one when it comes to the SEO is likely to form an organization to counterbalance the US and Central Asia and internationally. So that's more about Russia maintaining the sphere of influence. However, recent developments suggest that security might be playing a bigger role now and in the future. The Vostok's 2018 military exercises in the Russian Far East, which involved more than 300,000 Russian troops and 36,000 tanks, also included around 3,500 Chinese troops. In 2019, Russia also announced that it would develop a missile defense system with China that was on par with its own and that of the US. And then in October, 2020, Putin mentioned that a military alliance with China was not off the table in the future. So now onto the international standing hypothesis. So there's some support for this hypothesis, largely when it comes to the shared principles between China and Russia, namely that of multipolarity. Rhetorically, Russian Chinese joint declarations have a consistent theme of calling for a multipolar world and general opposition to the US. The latter aspect of this has in particular only been enhanced in recent years. However, the degree to which China in particular genuinely wants to be in a multipolar world now as compared to say in 1997 versus being the dominant regional or even global power is debatable. In other words, while multipolarity might still be a rhetorical talking point between the two, it's unclear if both countries actually want the same thing in the longer term. Moreover, even when shared alignment on international issues exists, this might not be a catalyst factor in and of itself for the relationship. International standing is, is hard to measure empirically, so I selected the proxy of UN voting data with the idea that if Moscow becomes more influential internationally, this could be reflected in greater alignment along key foreign policy issues with other countries. However, UN data shows based on the agreement index, which is how often two countries agree with each other on a scale from zero to one, that Russia and China had a value of 0.85 from 1974 to 1989 and 0.83 from 2009 to 2011, suggesting some alignment has always been there even during times of outright conflict. So therefore, similar principles and foreign policy outlooks alone cannot drive cooperation. Finally, onto the Putin explanation. 
So evidence is supportive that this has had a significant role, in particular the elite diplomacy between Putin and Xi. Not only do they share an affinity for the so-called Beijing consensus of authoritarian politics, state capitalism, and an emphasis on each state's sovereign right to select its own political system, they've also pushed repetitive re their respective countries towards more assertive foreign policies. The two also have a very well-documented friendship with Xi's first trip abroad to Russia in March 2013. And since then, the two, the two leaders have met nearly 30 times. And then finally, there's the question of Putin and his own desires for Russia. Putin himself in speeches and strategic documents has gone to great lengths to emphasize Russia's belonging in Asia, revealing perhaps a deeper sense of insecurity that Russia feels accepted by neither the East nor the West. To remedy this, Putin has repeatedly stated his goal to have Russia be a bridge between Europe and Asia, and once again, be a relative, relevant great power. So in terms of scholarly contributions, the primary contribution of my thesis is to add to the scholarship on pivots by extending the concept of a pivot beyond a US-centric focus to the case of Russia, and demonstrating that pivots are real, they can be measured, and not just of the US, but also for other rising powers like Russia. And then with respect to policy implications, there are several. First, the US should be cognizant of actions that can unintentionally drive Russia and China even closer together as it engages in great power competition. Second, Russia's pivot towards Asia and its efforts to maintain good relations with many countries are inherently contradictory and will be limited by the extent to which China is in conflict with other players in the region namely India. At the same time, because Russia has thus far successfully walked this tightrope, the US faces the challenge of Russia's long-standing relationship with India as it tries to form the so-called quad to counter China. But perhaps most of all, and of greatest relevance to US policymakers, is that Russia's pivot to Asia, and in particular, its growing strategic alignment with China is real and needs to be taken seriously. So finally, I would like to thank my advisors, Ambassador McFall and Professor Neymark for their guidance and support throughout the year. The CSAC teaching team, Dr. Ewing, Dr. Ziegert, and Dr. Mir, as well as other mentors, my girlfriend, Lisa, the rest of the CSAC cohort, and many friends and family here today. Thank you. Terrific job, Kyle. You can only hear me clap, but everybody is clapping alongside me on Zoom. Terrific. Um, let's, if you could stop sharing your slides and we can pull up everybody on the Zoom screen. There we go. And let's turn to Professor Neymark for the first question. Okay, thank you, uh, Kyle. That was very rich and uh, full uh, presentation. A lot to try to absorb into uh, in, into my brain this afternoon. But let, uh, but there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So I just have a few minutes. So I, th I think I mean I don't have a half an hour for questioning. Isn't that correct? Just a couple of yeah. How many minutes do we have, Doctor? Yeah. <laughs> We so, know. so it's hard to herd the cats <laughs> of faculty, right? So I'm going to ask that you each ask one question, your most burning questions, because I'm sure we'll have other people that want to jump into the Q&A session. Okay. Uh, I mean, Just I'm, an army, yourselves if I'm you an army brat. I follow orders. You know, I still do. Um, anyway, so, so let me talk about pivot then. Um, and, um, you know, I kept thinking about, uh, it, you know, it came up in the Obama administration and he was a basketball player and Mike played basketball, so did I as well. And I keep thinking about the basketball pivot and you're pivoting away usually from, from an opponent, you know, to find a place to pass the ball or shoot it or that kind of thing with one foot still on the ground and the other foot moving, right? That's a pivot, at least in basketball. I don't know how they define it in political science. Um, and whether they stole it from basketball or not, maybe you could tell me that. But here's the real question I, I have about the pivot. Uh, the Obama pivot, uh, you know, was in some senses a, a, a free choice pivot, meaning, you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, a push and pull. There was uh, there was some pull, obviously the Asian pull, but there wasn't a lot of push. Nobody was saying this is what you have to do. Um, in the case of uh, Putin and the pivot to China, which, you know, I think you've demonstrated very well and you've done a really nice job showing us uh, with your data what's happening and, uh, you know, and that it has to be taken seriously, there is a lot of, in some fashion, push. And that is to say, um, you know, problems with the West, problems with the United States, problems with Europe, you know, get them out of my hair. I don't need them anymore. They're causing me more grief than I can, I can take, you know, whether economically or especially politically. 
domestically, you know, I'm sick of them. So, so there's a lot of push. And then there's the pull from China, which you describe, which is, you know, uh, similar political and international points of view. So how do you, how do you think about these two different kinds of pivots? I mean, this is not a freely chosen pivot in some ways. It's not a pivot in the absence of powerful forces in the international system, and in some ways are pushing uh, Putin uh, in that direction. No, thank you, Professor Neymar, for the for the great question. So, yeah, I, I think definitely the push factors and the and the shifting international order now is probably the single greatest reason why the pivot now is happening and why so many previously attempted pivots did not. Since dating back to 2000, every single foreign policy concept of the Russian Federation has said, you know, we need to focus on Asia. Asia is where everything's going. We need to focus there, but from the data, it wasn't actually until there was the Ukrainian invasion in, in 2014 and then the subsequent Western sanctions that you really saw a demonstrable shift east. And I think that's something that's largely new. Um, in, in the early 2000s, Russia and China did talk to each other. They had lots of high level military to military contact, for example. But at the time, the biggest difference was that both countries still wanted to maintain some semblance of a, of a good relationship with the U.S., and the difference is nowadays, and from my perspective, that's no longer what either country perhaps wants. And so without that impediment, um, that's something that's really driving them together even further. Not only that they don't want to have the, a good relationship, but that they have an adversarial relationship with the U.S. now. Um, so I, th I think you're right in pointing out that, that it's very much the pull factors have been there for, for several years and those have gotten stronger. But I think more of the reason why it's happened now as opposed to not before is a lot of those push factors. Yeah, that demonstrates in some ways the importance of the, the whole Ukrainian crisis in some ways, doesn't it? Which shows just how deep then, um, you know, the, the incentives were to just say, you know, get fed up with the West, you know, and how it reacts to what you do and, and, and looking for ways to support yourself on the international scene with China. Thank you. Over to our other basketball player, Professor McFall. Thank you. I've actually played basketball with Barack Obama once, Norm. I don't know if I ever told you that. He's an extremely competitive did. guy. Extremely competitive guy. Uh, we lost 0 for 3 that day, and I thought he was going to fire me at the end of the day. Um, so Amy said I can only ask one question. So here's what I'm going to do, Kyle. I, want, I thought about asking about push versus pull. Uh, and in particular, why the, the original pivot to the West after the collapse of the Soviet Union failed. And then I thought about asking, you see what I'm doing, Amy? I thought about asking about regime type, which you and I have talked about for months and how to, you know, what, what role regime type plays uh, in your story, which, it, and how do you disaggregate that from Putin? But because I only get to ask one question, uh, this is the question I'm gonna ask. Um, you have a, you have the your four hypo hypotheses, right? And and I would call them um, intentions, different kinds of arguments. Uh, you very deliberately and rightly so, because we've talked about this. Um, uh, didn't say it's just one monocausal story here, right? And and I was listening very carefully to your language to see how it changes. This one mattered a little bit. This one didn't. Um, but I want to I want to tease that out. Tell us how. It, you know, the social science question of when there's multiple things at play, how we can, you know, give some, you know, what matters more? Is it 80, 20, 10, 5? I mean, how, give us some sense of how we should think about those things, because just saying it's everything is not very satisfying. And as you do that, the thing I'm most interested in is of your four boxes there, what changed in your own thinking over the course of writing this thesis? Is it basically you had you had you basically had these boxes in mind and you got done you know at the end of the year here and it's basically the same story or was there some change in your own thinking and I'm particularly interested in what data you found what what might have changed your thinking over the course of writing this thesis. Yeah. So no, thank you very much for for both the questions. Both great questions. Um, so I think in terms of like racking and stacking the different explanations, I think the, the economic hypothesis or the economic reasoning is by far the strongest in my mind. And the reason for that is, um, I wasn't able to include this in my presentation, but uh, you see the same trends across trade and foreign direct investment. And the reason why that's really significant 
is because while the Russian government has some influence over trade, ostensibly these are still a lot of private or semi-private companies that are engaging in trade. So it's not something the government is doing deliberately. And so that's where you see the economic forces are at play. At the same time, you also see that the government is doing something since Asia and, and China specifically are, are now some of the largest FDI trading partners with Russia. Um, which is, so I think it's really significant that you see with the economic hypothesis in particular, it's not just Putin's government, but it's also sort of the Russian economy as a whole reorienting itself. And that's not something that, you know, as powerful as Putin may be as the leader of Russia, that I don't believe he can unilaterally, you know, force a company to do something that's going to cost them billions of dollars. And so I think that that the fact that there is the the shift from the, the private sector as well really reveals how strong of an, an, an incentive that is. Um, Beneath that, I, I think the next one in my mind, the next two, they're probably very, very similar and, and tied almost, is the, the security explanation and then the, there's Putin himself. Um, the security explanation, I think in, in particular over the last several years is the relationship uh, with the US has become much more adversarial. I, I think it's important to caveat here that even though Russia might be you know, pivoting and, and looking to Asia, Russia is also not planning on trying to fight a war anytime in the Asia Pacific. Like they're, they're they're preparing for a conflict largely within Europe and, and elsewhere. But at the same time, it's about um, pivoting such that they, they give sufficient focus towards Asia that you know, they might have been neglecting before that. Um, and then when it comes to Putin himself, I think he undoubtedly plays a huge role, um, particularly when it comes to the China relationship. Um, under Hu Jintao, the, the, the rhetoric of, of the joint statements between um, Russia and China was, was very different. It was a lot more bland, very, very diplomatic. Um, and, and, you know, there obviously since 2013, there has been the, the shift in the, in the tenor of the relationship with the U.S., but I still think that there's undoubtedly a, a part of that that's the, the personal rapport as, as well as the ideological alignment of, of two authoritarian leaders seen sort of eye to eye. Um, and then lastly, I think just really the, the international standing is, is important, but I think it's, it's sort of the hardest to, to tease out exactly, you know, how much that, that has influenced um, everything. And then I, I think for, for your second question in terms of like what's changed. It wasn't right? a second question. It was just a big to the first question. Don't get me in trouble, man. <laughs> Apologies. Um, but but to answer that, I, I think initially coming in, I was very skeptical that, that this was actually a, a successful pivot in any way. Um, at the Eastern Economic Forum, it, it's very interesting when you go and there's all these different panels and all everyone talks about is like the massive quantities of steel or polymers of oil that they were producing. It was very almost like Soviet-esque of this is how much we produced. And it, it, there wasn't a whole lot of mention of like, well, you know, how profitable is this? This is actually something that's sustainable moving forward. And so I think initially I was very skeptical, um, but seeing sort of the, the confluence of different trends across numerous different data sources over the course of the year, um, became much more confident that this time might actually be different um, than, than previous attempts. That was a great answer, Kyle. That fantastic and fantastic thesis, by the way. I look forward to seeing the end and citing it in my own book. And for all the family members and friends of Kyle, you should be very proud of this young man today. But for the record, Mike, I just want to note there was a lot of gray zone activity to erode the international liberal order of this class. I counted five questions, not one. So let that be noted for the record. Um, we, we are running short on time, but I want to turn, because I know Professor Gottemuller has a question for Kyle. So Rose, over to you. Thank you very much. And for all the friends and relatives of Kyle on this uh, call today, I want to say he was great in my class too, where we talked about arms control topics. So good to see you here, Kyle, and congratulations on a great thesis, a great presentation today. I guess I'm pushing you a bit again on the limits uh, of the Russian pivot. It's been a theme running through some of the questions. How do you account for the lack of development in the Russian Far East, which to my mind simply invites the Chinese in and has caused you know, already some problems in, in that regard? If uh, you, you make a robust case for their, their military pivot, yes, for their investment pivot, for their sales on the economic side, but how are they going to sustain this pivot if the, if the Russian Far East remains so, so terribly undeveloped as it is and has been historically? Yeah, no, thank you, Professor Gottemuller for the, for the great question. Um, I, I think for me, like I, I don't necessarily, so in addition to the announcing the, the pivot to Asia, Putin also established the sort of Ministry of the Far East to try and get at this question exactly of like, how can you develop the Far East? And, and you know, as, as you are well aware, as well as, as others on the call, it's sort of been a perpetual problem for Russia. 
Um, I, I, from my research, I don't really see a way in which that will improve moving forward. Um, the, the Russian sort of innovation model, if you will, that, that I've seen and researched is very much, you know, throw money, throw money at a problem, mandate creativity and innovation, and then, you know, expect to see what happens. It's very different than what happens in the US and here in Silicon Valley. And so the extent to which Russia can develop sort of beyond being a, a, a resource supplier to China, I think is questionable. But that being said, like I, I'm more confident that even just being a resource supplier alone is, is sustainable, um, at least in the near to medium term, given how much China at this point relies in particular on Russia for their energy supplies. And, and you know, th there's a question in the longer term about the role of renewable energy might play and, and, and shifting away from fossil fuels. But in the near to medium term, I don't think that a lack of economic development in the Far East will necessarily um, spell the end of any sort of pivot here by Russia. Well, Kyle, we've come to the end of, of your presentation and Q&A. Please join me in congratulating Kyle for a terrific presentation, great discussion. There's still time to incorporate all of these questions, Kyle, into your thesis before you turn it in. Uh, it's my delight to introduce Corinne Zanoli, who is from Newtown Square, Pennsylvania. She's majoring in political science with concentrations in international relations and political economy. She became interested in public-private partnerships through her work at a tech startup, and her thesis expands on this interest by examining the effects of U.S. defense industry consolidation uh, on procurement outcomes. She served as a research assistant on projects about the U.S. intelligence community, offensive cyber operations, and information warfare. And in addition to her academic interests, Corinne plays field hockey for Stanford and the United States women's national team. And after she graduates, she'll go on to be an analyst at Goldman Sachs. Her thesis title is Better Together, question mark, the effect of US defense industry consolidation on procurement outcomes. And her thesis advisors are Dr. Brad Larson and me. Corinne, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Ziegart for the kind introduction. I will now share my slides. Can everybody see? All right. So my thesis is titled, as Dr. Ziegart just mentioned, Better Together, an examination of the effects of US defense industry consolidation on procurement outcomes. In 1994, the Secretary of Defense, Les Aspen, and Deputy Secretary William Perry hosted a dinner now referred to as the Last Supper, in which they gathered the top executives from the large defense contractors, informing them that looming cuts to, further, to defense spending would lead to half of the companies represented in the room going out of business in the next five years. As a solution, they encouraged further and more rapid consolidation. Norbin Augustine, the CEO of Martin Marietta at the time, referred to the remarks at the dinner as a, quote, unappetiz unappetizing and highly prophetic fortune cookie, end quote. Of the 107 major fir defense firms active in the market at the start of the 1990s, only five remained at the end of the decade. The major defense contractors today, referred to as the primes, are Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Boeing, Raytheon Technologies, and Northrop Grumman. My thesis asks, has the consolidation of the US defense industry had an adverse effect on procurement outcomes? And I examined three different effects. The first is cost overruns, the second, schedule delays, and the third, innovation and investment in innovation. I will give a brief overview of where my presentation is headed before I dive in. I'll first discuss defense industry consolidation from 2000 to 2020 to set the stage for the rest of my findings. I will then relay my hypotheses and discuss my original data sets um, and then define a few key terms because this space tends to be a little bit jargony. I will then give a very brief overview of my schedule delay findings and innovation findings before focusing on my cost overrun findings. Then I will discuss my case study, which is the ground-based strategic deterrent, and then implication, implications of the findings of my thesis for further research. The defense industry consolidation has increased since 2000. From 2000 to 2019, 3,990 M&A deals took place, with activity peaking in 2007, 2011, and 2019. The total yearly deal volume has increased dramatically especially within the last five years. Between 2017 and 2020, the deal volume was 2.8 times higher than the deal volume from 2013 to 2016. Over this period, the prime contractors have increased their total market share, but particularly in the last five years. In 2019, according to Bloomberg, the five primes account together 
for 70.5% of the market share of the defense space and security market, which is quite a large number. They've also been involved in a number of recent M&A transactions, um, which are highlighted in the chart here. Uh, notably, Raytheon and United Technologies merged to form Raytheon Technologies, which is one of the primes that I mentioned in my previous slide. And Northrop Grumman's acquisition of Orbital ATK and Lockheed Martin's intended acquisition of Aerojet Rocketdyne are both relevant to my case study. There's two contrasting views on the effects of consolidation in this in industry. Policymakers tend to view it as suboptimal because of cost overruns, schedule delays, and technical, technological problems with products. However, the view of recent economic studies has been that the effects of defense, indus the defense industry con consolidation are not always negative, and that there are efficiencies to be gained through M&A activity. So I have four hypotheses two of which concern my cost overrun portion of my thesis, one of which concerns schedule delays, and one of which is focused on innovation and investment innovation. In terms of cost overruns, I hypothesize that low competition is more likely to produce cost overruns for major defense acquisition programs, which is in line with the policymaker perspective. My second hypothesis is that low competition is associated with lower per unit costs for major defense acquisition programs, which is in line with the perspective from the two economic studies I mentioned previously. Low competition is more, my third hypothesis for schedule delays is that low competition is more likely to result in program delays. And my fourth hypothesis for innovation is that major defense firms involved in M&A activities spend less on company funded research and development post acquisition than pre acquisition. I have constructed three original data sets to address the three potential effects I am examining, which are highlighted in the slide here. I'll now jump into a few key definitions before getting into my findings. First, what is a major defense acquisition program? Because I've already said this about three or four times in my previous two slides. Basically, a major defense acquisition program is a program that exceeds a large spending threshold for either procurement or total research development test and evaluation costs, or is designated by the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. Think the big deal programs, like the F-35 and ones that you've probably heard of. Each major defense acquisition program is required to report their cost and schedule data, including quantity observations to Congress in the form of things called selected acquisition reports. While the full individual reports are not all publicly accessible in a consistent manner, the DOD publishes summary tables that include cost and quantity information for all of the major defense acquisition programs in the portfolio for an associated fiscal year. These are the observations with which I built my data set for the cost overrun um, portion of my thesis. Another important feature of selected acquisition reports is that they track program rebaselining. So each major defense acquisition program is given a baseline cost and quantity estimate by which cost, schedule, and quantity growth are all measured against. These baseline estimates are updated periodically as the cost performance and schedule quantity goals of the programs go undergo a significant change or are reevaluated at major milestones in the procurement process. I will now briefly overview my schedule delay findings. As, as a refresher, for my schedule delay chapter, I hypothesize that low competition is more likely to result in program delays for major defense acquisition programs. I found that the consolidation of, as the consolidation of the defense industry increased, schedule delays for major defense acquisition programs were more likely. Additionally, I found that policy interventions have helped to slow schedule growth, but the average schedule delay for programs is still around two years. The observations prior to 2010 exist more as a comparison points because they were not consistently done for every single year. But essentially what this chart shows is that the average delay in delivering initial capabilities since the first full estimate grew until 2016 and has since declined, but the average delay is still over two years. Said another way, the schedule growth is continuing to increase, but at a slower rate. Now I will overview my innovation findings. My innovation hypothesis was that major defense firms involved in M&A activity spend less on company funded research and development post acquisition than pre acquisition. My, I found that as the defense industry has become more consolidated, four of the five prime contractors has actually spent more on company funded research and development over the period of analysis. However, four of the five primes with the exception of Northrop Grumman have experienced decreases in research and development spending as a percentage of revenue over the period of analysis. As I learned from reviews of existing literature, public statements and interviews with experts in the field, the DOD 
does a poor job of harnessing private sector innovation. And the epicenter of innovation within the defense industry lies not with the primes, but with smaller firms. It's difficult to tell if mergers are simply cutting innovation or the driver behind the R&D findings um, because they're kind of observationally equivalent. And this is the chart that shows the R&D to revenue for the prime contractors. The yellow is Northrop Grumman. And as you can see, it did experience a net increase, but it was very small. Finally, I will move to my cost overrun portion. So for my cost overrun analysis, I began with two hypotheses that pulled from different aspects of the literature. First, that low competition is more likely to produce cost overruns for major defense acquisition programs, pulled from the policymaker perspective. And the second, that low competition is associated with lower per unit costs for major defense acquisition programs from the perspective of the main economic studies focused on this area. I then performed two different analyses. My primary analysis with replicates a methodology from a previous study performed by Dr. Nayantara Hensel, who was the chief economist of the Navy at the time and on an updated data set. And the secondary analysis is evaluating the impact of program rebaselining. Dr. Hensel's study was run on a data set spanning 1981 to, 2000, to 2006, and I replicated her methodology on an updated data set spanning 2006 to 2020, the details of which are on the slide here. Essentially, what I found was that both hypotheses were validated. Post-merger programs have a, sorry, low competition is more likely to produce cost overruns for MDAPs was on a co total cost basis with 65.22% of programs show with statistically significant results experiencing a post-merger increase in current year cost and baser dollars. However, 62.5% of programs with statistically significant results saw a post-merger decrease in per unit cost. Essentially, post-merger programs have a statistically significant relationships with increases in current year costs and base year dollars. So the correlated decrease between rebase, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead, my bad. For my secondary analysis, I focused on the effect of rebaselining of programs on total cost, which is measured as current year cost and base year dollars and cost per unit. Dr. Hensel's study counted rebaselined programs as separate entities pre and post rebaselining. So basically as two different programs. So for this analysis, I counted rebaseline programs as the same entity as one program pre and post rebaselining. I utilized two different variables to track rebaselining. One, which was referred to in the slide as rebaseline programs, which was zero if no rebaselining occurred over the life of the program and one if any occurred. And a rebaselining indicator variable, which was zero prior to the rebaselining and one after the rebaselining occurred or stayed zero if the program did not go through any rebaselining. I found marginally significant evidence that the current year costs are higher in programs that get rebaselined than in those that don't. I found statistically significant evidence that cost per unit is lower in programs that get rebaselined than in those that do not. The results for programs post rebaselining were insignificant. So essentially, here's kind of the overview of my findings. Rebaseline programs have a marginally significant relationship with increases in current year costs and base year dollars. So the correlated decrease between rebaselining and cost per unit is likely driven by quantity increases rather than cost increases. This would make sense in the context of the primary analysis findings, and also within the context of the GIO's finding that MDAP, MDAPs have, quote, generally stabilized non-quantity related cost growth, end quote. The broader implication is that by treating programs that were rebaselined as separate entities pre and post rebaselining, the Hensel methodology likely does not capture the full cost growth of these systems. The phenomenon that cost per unit decreases are likely associated with quantity increases rather than cost decreases, as seen in both analyses, is important because quantities are planned to increase over the life of the system. Hence, the decision points for low rate initial production and then full rate production within the acquisition process. This calls into question for further analysis whether decreased cost per unit is actually indicative on its face of improved efficiency or instead is simply indicative of maybe planned increases that have taken place. There's also reason to believe that quantity increases are also not necessarily tied to the system performance. In other words, the government is not necessarily buying more of something simply because they like it. For example, the F-35 is a well-known mess of a program, but its current year quantity actually increased by 13 planes from 2015 to 2016. The same is true of the CVN-78, which is an aircraft carrier. The system had multiple delivery delays prior to 2017, Yet the quantity increased from three to four, 
from 2016 to 2017, which drove down an otherwise increasing cost per unit. Essentially, by ordering more of a system that does not work, a dysfunctional system could look like it is getting more efficient on a cost per unit basis when it really does not actually imply anything about the performance, readiness, cost efficacy, et cetera, in terms of procuring an actual working product. Therefore, it's dangerous to couch programs that are experiencing a decrease in cost per unit as efficient without a related evaluation of their performance. The right question is whether cost per unit is actually an indicator of efficiency and what other metrics should be taken into consideration. I will now move into the discussion of my case study, which is focused on the ground-based strategic deterrent, which is the replacement for the Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missile system, the ground component of the nuclear triad. The bid process for this system is a prime example of the effects of diminished competition, strategic acquisition activity by the primes, and the efficacy of current cost growth methodologies. In the exploring the Minuteman III system has been going on since 2010, but then in October 2016, the initial request for proposals for the system went out, and three companies submitted proposals, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and Boeing. Two were ultimately awarded first stage contracts, which were Boeing and Northrop Grumman. A month after the initial contract was awarded, Northrop Grumman announced that it had agreed to acquisition terms with Orbital ATK. What is significant about the acquisition of Orbital ATK is that there are only, at the time, two solid rocket motor suppliers in the defense industrial base, Orbital ATK and Aerojet Rocketdyne. And so when Northrop Grumman acquired Orbital ATK, they, they, they sorry, they, they cornered the market on, or, on Orbital's products. Boeing intended to use Orbital ATK as the supplier of the solid rocket motors for their design, but Northrop Grumman dragged its feet on signing an agreement to wall off Boeing's IP from Northrop Grumman as a whole. Boeing then subsequently withdrew from the ground-based strategic deterrent bid because they could not find a competitive price for the rocket motor that was necessary to build the system. The CEO of their defense segment said, quote, we lack confidence in the fairness of any procurement that does not correct between this basic imbalance between competitors, end quote. Boeing also, after withdrawing from the bid, approached Northrop Grumman about forming a best of industry team to work on the ground-based strategic deterrent together, with North which Northrop Grumman declined. All of this is fine and well, but what's really important is how the diminished competition at how the acquisition cost estimate grew as the bid process became less competitive. In 2015, the program was estimated to have an acquisition cost of $62.3 billion. When the, the, pro, the companies in the running to have the final contract were decreased to two, it ended up at an $85 billion estimate. After the acquisition of Orbital ATK and Boeing's subsequent withdrawal from the bid process, in Northrop Grumman's formation of an industry team, including Lockheed Martin and Aerojet Rocketdyne, so basically all of the suppliers are in the Northrop Grumman camp of, of solid rocket motors, you ended up at an acquisition cost estimate at the milestone B of $95.8 billion, which is a 53.8 increase from the initial estimate. Lockheed Martin announced its merger with Aerojet Rocketdyne in December of 2020, which would leave the solid rocket motor supplier base without a supplier independent of any of the prime contractors. Raytheon is now challenging this merger as it would have a negative impact on their business, and the FTC has extended the review timeline of the merger to further scrutinize it. It will be really interesting to see what they decide going forward. I'm now gonna go through a few implications of my findings. The first is that further defense industry consolidation should be scrutinized in regards to total market share, but also concerning control of product verticals, as can be seen from the ground-based strategic deterrent case study with the solid rocket motor product vertical. Also that implementation of knowledge-based acquisition practices is a promising way to slow the co cost growth of uh, slow the growth of cost overruns and schedule delays, but further intervention is necessary to see actual decreases. Furthermore, greater accountability for program failures is necessary for improving procurement outcomes. When things go wrong, are people held accountable? And if 
And that needs to be looked at a little bit further. The, for, finally, the GAO and the DOD should dedicate resources to better tracking the outcomes of M&A transactions and their effect on supply chains in order to assess implications and create urgency to address any anti-competitive outcomes. The Biden administration is turning significant focus to the reevaluation of legacy systems, as evidenced by their declaration in the Interim National Security Strategic Guidance on the screen, and statements made by appointees and other prominent Democrats. The key word here is unneeded. Just because a system is a legacy system does not necessarily make it bad. We are approaching key decision points for unneeded legacy systems, and we furthermore need to find ways to better prioritize investment in cutting edge technologies. The future of US defense capabilities depends on it. Finally, I would like to take a minute to thank my advisors, Dr. Ziegart and Dr. Larson for all of your help over the last year and Dr. Ziegart, who has been my pre-major advisor and my major advisor all the way through my college career. Um, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Ewing and Dr. Muir um, for their help with the cohort and my other mentors, interviewees, the cohort, my friends and family. Thank you so much for all of your support and for listening to me talk about this endlessly over the last year. Um, I'm happy to take any questions now. Congratulations. Wonderful job, Corinne. Um, we will turn first to Professor Larson. So this is my first time attending a, a final presentation. What am I expected next? Questions or? Well, if you follow Michael McFall, you'll ask five questions in, in under the guise of one. But the but the norms are you can ask what you kick off our Q and A discussion by talking a little bit about Corinne's thesis and then asking her a question that she should consider as she revises. Okay, so I, I think it's been it's been uh, uh, she's made a lot of progress. I, I like this I like this idea. I think it's a fun one to be thinking about, and it's uh, it's really cool how she's tackling it from so many different angles and, and uh, talking to people about it in the field. I think a lot of uh, a lot of uh, it's easy as an academic to to uh, to not focus on uh, or to just to just to just focus on what you, what you can learn yourself without talking to people that are outside of academics. And uh, and she's uh, she's she's been uh, been been reading a lot of the, the, the details, the, the dirty details and talking to people about it and learning about this. I think that's a that makes for a much more powerful, uh, powerful research point and and uh, much uh, broader insights. So I guess the one question I have is just, just still trying to understand this this distinction be, between uh, total cost and and per unit cost. And if those differ at all, then it's only because number of units change. Just in a very simple case, right? That's so. Just trying to understand how uh, how you think the, how you think about the uh, the quantity. Of, of units being produced uh, here and, and why that would change pre and post merger. And uh, it sounds like it must have gone up if per unit costs have gone down. And, and I realize you mentioned a little bit, maybe this is my five questions in one. You mentioned that you mentioned that it's uh, that it's that some of that is pre scheduled already in there for increases to happen. But I think the part you really got to explain is, is uh, why the pre scheduling changed before and after mergers, since that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing that per unit costs decrease, which means that. It can, it's it's a that there is a difference between uh, between the the the, the, the merged entities uh, increase uh, already in place increasing schedule and the uh, and the uh, the not the ones that didn't merge in in this in this empirical analysis. Yes, and I think that's something that I definitely want to explore further in the next week or so and get a little bit deeper into the analysis of why. To your broad question about the difference between total cost and cost per unit. So the way the cost per unit is calculated is the current year cost and base year dollars divided by the current year quantity estimate. So if the current year cost and base year dollars is going is increasing, the only way that the associated cost per unit could be decreasing is if the quantity was dropping. Or sorry, the quantity was increasing but at a faster rate so then it would drop the total cost per unit. So that's kind of the interesting thing there. I think the um to your to your second point, I think that uh, programs that part of the way that the procurement process works is that you end up with a low rate initial production number of quantity units, and then it can increase afterwards. And so there is kind of a natural increase somewhat, and that's not true for every program. Every program is a little bit different, um, but generally speaking, it, it kind of trends to more units are produced over the period of life of the program. So there is a natural increase in the denominator of the cost per unit calculation baked in. Um, 
And so I think I definitely want to look into that a little bit more and get more into the details, as you said, but um, we can have that conversation after this as well. But a great question. Okay, so now I get to the prerogative of asking a question and I want to, I'm going to violate my own rules and ask a two part question. <laughs> so um, you've delved into a incredibly complicated arcane area of defense acquisition that is very opaque, uh, potentially by design, but it's clearly an area where it's very hard to study from the outside. Mm -hmm. So um, as you presented, you found big delays, though they're decreasing overall, mm -hmm. but big scheduling delays. You found cost increases, but per unit costs going down. So, and Professor Larson's, you know, talked about that. And you found R&D declining as a percentage of overall revenues. Mm -hmm. but that's not a great picture, right, of defense industry consolidation. So my question is a policy question. Mm -hmm. As you know, um, the new Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition, a guy who knows this process well, is a reformer, right? Michael mm -hmm. Brown, the head of the Defense Innovation Unit. If you were advising Michael Brown, now that you've got a champion of competition and innovation in that all important seat, what would you tell him that is the most important thing you found that he should do as a result of your thesis? I think the most important thing is that there needs to be greater accountability for when programs are experiencing cost overruns or schedule delays. Um, because I think a lot of times it is looked at as a problem but it's not necessarily, there's no actionable change. And I think there needs to be greater accountability metrics and deviations from, you know, if, if you are going to go past your, like uh, past the, if you're going to overrun your schedule or overrun your cost by a certain percentage, then like we will go find another supplier or like we will not give you this program or there has to be some kind of consequence to keep people from just kind of allowing programs to continue on and on and on and on um, like this. But th that to be said, that is very hard to do and very hard to find the correct incentives to push people into that perspective, particularly because a lot of legacy systems are also kind of viewed as job programs as well, with jobs being hand in, put in different districts and a lot of lobbying interests involved. So now we'll open it up to questions from the class. You can raise your hand, either physical hand or your Zoom hand at the bottom of your screen. first of all great job like you'd make took a lot of data and made sense out of it which props to you my question comes kind of it's speculative so i i read a piece from one of my international security classes about like drone warfare but having swarms of drones and so you in your thesis were mentioning the cost per unit was going down could this if warfare moves in that direction where you just need a lot of tiny things could this be almost an advantage or do you still see it as a disadvantage? I'm sorry, could you repeat? I'm not sure I caught the end of it. Yeah, so like if you have more like swarm drone warfare, if that became a thing um, and you need lots of units and in your thesis, you were talking about having, I guess, lower cost per unit, could that be a positive outcome for defense? Um, I think without knowing the specifics of drone swarm warfare, it's not a, something that I've really looked at as part of this, but I think my initial reaction would be if that's where the strategic need of future US defense capabilities is being met, it would kind of also help decrease the total amount that you're spending outside of per unit cost, outside of everything, you know, if that's going to be the anal, the, the area that you channel focus into, um, and you can buy more units for a cheaper price, it could drop the amount that you're spending. Um, that being said, um, it de really depends on what the U.S. strategic priorities are and kind of what U.S. defense capabilities really need. I kind of see the defense industry moving toward more towards a focus on software rather than, oh, hey, build this plane or we need this tank or this thing. I think we're moving into an area where it's a lot going to be a lot more about software with hardware attached rather than hardware focused with software being integrated in. 
So Corinne, we have a question for you from CSAC Honors alum, Sam Lisbon, who has also done research and now has a job in this space. And so Sam's question is, well, first, Corinne, great presentation, he says, and he says, you seem to directly relate innovation to the R&D budget of a given organization. But this implies that a dollar of research and development is equally effective in organizations of different sizes. So his question is, do you think that's the case? Is a dollar of R&D a dollar of R&D, no matter how big the organization is? And if it's not the case, what would you speculate the effect of mergers and acquisitions would be in the efficacy of R&D spending within the defense primes? Yes, so Sam kind of got right to the point that I omitted for time um, <laughs> in my discussion. Thank you, Sam. Um, but basically a dollar of R&D, he's right. A dollar of R&D in company A versus company B could mean two completely different things. It's not necessarily the amount spent, it's how it's spent, what it's spent on, where it's focused, what the need is. I mean, you can go through a whole list of things. So that's why I kind of did a dual methodology within my art, art within my innovation chapter, looking at both R&D spending, but also talking to experts in the field and trying to assess the quality of the innovation in the space um, from a different capacity. There's a couple of other studies that have taken different approaches to um, this comparison as well, which I've cited and talked about in the actual thing. Um, but I, you know, in terms of the effect of MA activities, I think it's it's really hard to tell whether MA has it. M&A is affecting R&D spending trends or if it's cutting of innovation from inside of the organization because they're kind of the same observationally um, or it's really hard to distinguish. So I don't know, I think is a good question. And I think it's one to delve into a little bit further. So thanks. So our final question uh, comes from Professor Gottmuller and then Corinne, you get the last word. Professor Gottmuller, over to you. Well, this is a kind of funny question, Corinne. You obviously did an enormous amount of work and I'm very impressed. I really liked learning more about the cost overruns in the ICBM program. I had heard about it and read about it, but did not know the details. So that's an astonishing tale. Thank you so much. My uh, very simple question is now knowing everything you know about these majors, would you like to work for one of them? Um. I, to be honest, I don't know. I wouldn't be opposed to it. Um, but at the same time, I think it would be really interesting to be in, um, you know, a, a, in the, I'm in, actually, I'm in Hacking for Defense right now, um, which is run by Professor Blank and Professor Felter and a number of other things, which, and Kate is actually on my Hacking for Defense team and Kyle is actually on another team in the class. Um, and I think it would be really interesting. I, I've learned a lot from viewing the defense industry from the perspective of somebody that's trying to start something and break in and make a difference. Um, and I think that would be a really interesting space because there's a lot of cutting edge innovation that's going on there um, that is absolutely fascinating. So moral to the story, I don't know where life is going to take me, but um, I, I think both would have upsides, downsides, and it would just be a very interesting space to be a part of. Well, well good luck and they'll be lucky to have you. <laughs> Well, we do know where life is taking all of our honors students. That's called graduation. So congratulations to this entire class for four weeks of fantastic presentations and the be best, better yet to come with the written theses. Program note for everybody viewing, we are having a virtual CSAC honors commencement ceremony coming soon to a Zoom screen near you. Saturday, June the 5th from 10 a.m. to 1130. And we'll be sending out email details uh, about that as well. But please join me in congratulating all eight of our CSAC honor students on a terrific job doing their presentations. Well done, everybody.